So, uh, I'm John Potter, um, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, I'm very heartened to see so many of you uh, taking time out of your busy lives to um, join us. I think it uh, means a lot. It means a lot, um, you know, personally just to, to know that our town is uh, ready to dig in and be engaged in this and, and um, to uh, work together on this. It means a lot to me. So, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor now over to Shanta, and uh, we'll get on with our show. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, so, as we all know, there have been lots of conversations and uh, lots of efforts and continuing efforts around public art as we know it in Brattleboro. And I just want to share a little bit of a story, and I promise not to bore you. So, this specific meeting or this specific iteration of public art actually came from a Facebook post. And I never thought I'd see the day that we'd be referencing tweets and Facebook as something that became something actually real. Uh, sometime back in July, I shared a post that I thought was fairly innocuous about Lynn, Massachusetts. Lynn, Massachusetts was using murals to help uplift their community, boost their economy, and they weren't just any murals, they were very vibrant, rich, something reminiscent to what I had just seen in Detroit on my road trip uh, at the beginning of the summer. So I saw it and I shared it and just flippantly said, why can't we do this here in Brattleboro? And so a thread ensued and a couple of people said, well, I'd like to meet and talk about it. I said, oh great, another meeting. Well, let's just see what happens with that. Uh, the meeting started at the works, and by the end of that week, a potluck was being planned. And so, there you have it. Um, it was an attempt to try to get everybody in the same room to talk about public art. Um, I know many of you in the room, and some, of, some, of, some people who could not make it here, have been doing a lot of work on creative placemaking. Um, so this. I like to think of this meeting, this gathering, as John and I and some of the co-planners have often mentioned it, as a continuation and to see what can happen next and what might birth out of this if we continue to figure out what it means to talk about how to make Brattleboro look and feel like the arts community we believe that it is. And so, for example, um, some people might have seen, uh, she's a Polynesian Haitian dancer in one of the windows of one of the storefronts. You know, and that was just a brief example of some of the ways we wish to make the town feel like the arts that we believe that it's very capable of. Uh, so we want to invite you to have this conversation with us. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention there have been also some challenges around some views around public art and what we believe is public art here and things that people have not always felt inclusive about. And so this is also our attempt to include everybody as best we can and make an attempt to see what can grow out of this. Uh, so. I'll kick things back over to John, who will tell you a little bit about the Vermont Creative Network. And also, there are a couple of housekeeping things we'd like to remind you of before we get started with our panel. Thank you. So as, as Shanta said, I'm here not only representing the Latches, um, but also representing the Vermont uh, Creative Network. And uh, if you don't know what that is, um, the Vermont Creative Network was established about a year and a half ago by the legislature as an initiative of the Vermont Arts Council um, to be a collective and gathering point of artists, uh, individual artists, organizations, businesses, communities, uh, with the goal of advancing Vermont's creative sector um, with a very broad definition of advance and a very broad definition of creative sector. Uh, it was inspired by the model of the uh, farm to plate network and the success story that that has been connecting farmers and restaurants and um, funders and transportation companies and social service organizations and everything that else that you can imagine around, um, around these shared issues and that's been very successful and the thinking was what can we do 
um, for the creative sector that might look like that. Uh, the Vermont Creative Network is set up um, with a statewide steering committee, and then uh, they establish six regional zone teams. Uh, I'm on the southern zone team, which encompasses um, um, Bennington area, Brattleboro area, and, and I think it spills over a little bit uh, in, into Weston. Um, so that kind of area. There are a couple of other people from the zone, the southern zone here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge them. There's Matthew Perry from Bennington. You could say hello. And Robert McBride from Bellows Falls, who many of you may know. Um, it's, it's a real joy to um, work on this uh, with them. We're just, we're just sort of getting started, but I want to make you aware of, of that. And, you know, our job is, um, you know, not to come from top down and tell everyone how to play and do things. Our job is to um, serve as conduits and connecting points and try to bring uh, individuals, groups, sectors together, hopefully uh, funders as well, all to the table. So um, you know who I am and where to find me if you have ideas anything you'd like to air, uh, please come uh, talk to me about that. Um, be delighted to talk with you. Um, the Vermont Arts Council had initially planned to be, have a representative here tonight. They could not uh, make it tonight. They send their greetings and their regrets, and um, they did make it very clear that they would be happy to uh, send a representative down to work with um, us again, whether we gather as a big group or whether we formulate some working groups, um, but they, they're very interested in uh, lending whatever expertise uh, and knowledge and wisdom that they can and support. So I uh, wanted to um, make sure that you knew all that. Also wanted to um, say that, you know, there certainly will be, we'd like to hear from all of you, as many of you as we can. Uh, some of you may be a little shy, some of you uh, we may not be able to get to. Uh, we have put um, these sheets on the wall here to try and capture some ideas, some thoughts about public art with some question prompts, but we really want to uh, make sure that you feel like you have an opportunity to uh, get your idea in front of us and others um, if you can't or choose not to uh, mention, mention it here now. i uh, also like to um, say this, you know, we um, certainly would like to have the guideline here of a very respectful uh, conversation uh, we value everybody's input. We, um, we hope that everyone, um, you know, ha enjoys this evening in the spirit of uh, community, collegiality, and respect. So um, on that note, uh, let's pop the cork on our panelists. And I think um, we'll have everyone uh, introduce themselves and uh, spend about five minutes sharing some views on public art and what they do, uh, that kind of thing. And um, <laughs> Um, my name is Elsie Smith, and I'm the co-founder and artistic director of the New England Center for Circus Arts. Um, I can hardly express how happy I am to be sitting up here, and I have a lot of you to thank for that, um, that I can be here and represent NECA in this community still, so thank you very much. Um, I'm a little late to the panel in the sense that I have an identical twin sister who uh, had the conversation with Shanta originally and then passed the information to me, so I feel a little underprepared. Um, but I was thinking about what public art means to me. Um, I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and perform uh, in venues where people paid a lot of money for the opportunity to see me fly around through the air. Um, I performed in theaters with you know, such iconic architecture that just walking through the door was an intimidating experience. And uh, that was definitely not public art. Um, I have had the opportunity also to be part of some really memorable public art experiences um, where people could just stumble on me in the oddest of places. I've uh, performed in the grocery aisle at a food exposition. Um, I've done public art in the middle of a roundabout next to a train station, uh, in the park in the middle of a city, on a city street between the Starbucks and the Gap, and in an airport just between the gates. Um, and I've had the opportunity to create pretty, what I might, I'm, I'm gonna call elite work just for the 
to have a term to sort of wrap around it. Um, in one year, I had a chance to create an aerial fabric piece that was designed for a specialty stage with lights and sound, and all my entrances and exits were choreographed, and the music was edited, and the costume was designed especially for it. Um, and I performed that on a theater at, the, at an aerial dance festival. I came home, and I was hired to perform that literally in the grocery store aisle at a food exposition. Um, and so there was, I was between the Frito-Lay and the Coca-Cola, <laughs> literally. Uh, and there was no theatrical lights. Uh, it's not really any audience. There's a couple smattering of plastic chairs, um, concrete, warehouse lighting, um, just me, a little boom box, my little fabric, and 20 foot of ceiling space. And um, after that performance, I was really shy about that performance because I thought, this isn't going to work. You know, it's not what I prepared for. Um, but after that performance, a woman walked up to me and shared with me her story of encountering me in a public art performance. And she said that she had spent that morning at her mother's hospital bed, and uh, her mother was dying of cancer, and it was not a good day. And so she needed something to break up her day, and so she went to work, and her boss sent her to this food expo. And she walked down the aisle, and there I was hanging 20 feet in the air with impassioned music playing and I was doing my aerial fabric and um, she told me that she cried and thanked me for being there for her. That experience completely moved her. It was unexpected for her to come across art in her day. She wasn't planned. And for me, this is the story of what public art can be. Um, it's art that arrives in unexpected places that you encounter without pre-planning or can encounter without pre-planning. Um, and it's important to me that it's also free or virtually free to the recipient. Um, one other little thing for me that's also important is it is, should also be art that the artist is paid to present. So for me, that particular experience uh, with that woman was a prime example of what I like to see about public art. Um, so that's what I've been thinking about for public art, my experience with public art, and what I think uh, I personally value as public art. So thank you. Thank you. I apologize for reading ahead of time, but <laughs> um, I'm Jen Austin. I'm the only staff person for the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance. And um, although we rarely call it public art, we do invest in creative placemaking, which um, falls under our mandates for beautification and design, promotions, and also economic development. Um, that's because Creating places that are safe, comfortable, and inviting strengthens communities. Um, it attracts locals and visitors who spend more time and money in those areas. So we're often approached by people who have, have ideas. Um, and for those who are actively pursuing those ideas, we offer connections, resources, and sometimes just advice. Um, we also have small facade improvement grants as well as economic development grants. And we do <laughs> offer promotional and technical support. Um, we've helped launch some arts-related projects like the Literary Festival, Gallery Walk, Southern Vermont Dance Fest. And we do create events like the Brattle Boo that's coming up, which incorporates some aspects of public art. There's um, a uh, jack-o'-lantern carving contest, which you're all invited to carve a pumpkin and enter the contest. And we do sponsor some murals. Um, and then there are projects that are completed by people who would never consider themselves artists, like the development of Pliny Park, um, the Downtown Flower Program, and the Holiday Lights Program. And I think that um, that's kind of the beauty of coming at it from the creative placemaking standpoint, is that you really don't have to be an artist to think like one. You really don't have to have the economic development background to act like you do. Um, you can still have an impact there. And I'll share with you uh, one of our latest projects. 
that I think sort of is an example of how this comes together. Um, I'd been working with a group on a big collaborative effort. It was a three-year proposal for a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. I know there's some people here who've been working on that. Um, it was kind of a long shot, really highly competitive national grant. Uh, most of the funding goes to large cities, and it had a really quick turnaround. So <clears throat> that proposal was submitted, and as a group, we continued to meet because there was a lot of excitement about the ideas that were coming forth, and there was a lot of opportunity that hadn't been there before. Um, so around the same time, the National Main Street Program announced that they had a placemaking grant. And again, that was a really highly competitive grant, funding going to mostly big cities, and it had a really tight turnaround. But there was some potential there, and so I contacted Lissa at 118 Elliott, and I started the conversation the same way I do way too many, which was I have this kind of crazy idea. And we sort of uh, were off and running. So we brainstormed, we de developed uh, what seemed like a fairly feasible plan, and it was inspired in part by the Inter International Parking Day, and we thought we would create a mobile space that would connect locals and visitors to the literary legacies of Brattleboro. It was kind of a lofty idea. Um, so we submitted the grant and we moved on, and the larger group did continue to meet, and we were planning ways that we could continue to implement some of the projects, even if we didn't get the grants. Um, and then, pretty much to everybody's surprise, we got the first grant. Uh, it was the placemaking grant from the National Main Street Center, and I really can't even go into all of the crazy ups, downs, turnarounds that uh, happened once we got that notice. But um, I can say that thanks to locals who supported us, we were able to launch the project. So Miles, which is a mobile mini pop-up museum, will be rolling into the Literary Festival this year. And <clears throat> I don't want to give too much of it away, but it, because I want you guys to come and experience it, but it will feature Lucy Terry Prince, who was the first known African-American poet, who was also a fierce advocate for um, fighting for your rights under the law. And she lived and owned property in Guilford. So <clears throat> I can say that her story is pretty inspiring and it does have relevance to today. So hopefully you guys will all come to that. Um, not only did we get that first grant, but the grant for the larger project also came through. So Miles will be the first project of the longer term uh, three-year project. <clears throat> and I just want to say that through this process, um, some of the things that I really love about Brattleboro were reinforced. And I'll just share those with you quickly. But when you start talking about your ideas, you realize that um, maybe your idea wasn't so crazy after all. <laughs> and no, for whatever reason. <laughs> Um, and also that there are so many talented people here who are willing to get involved that you can do things that you probably wouldn't even realize you can do. Um, another really important thing is that people here are willing to take a risk and they'll hop aboard your crazy train if they kind of know where you're going. Um, and then the last point is, even if you miss that first train, there's definitely at least one more coming right behind it. So. <laughs> Um, and those are real gifts of this community that I'm not sure we always fully appreciate. Um, so anyhow, I think there's important work being done. I think that people are coming together in new, exciting ways, and I'm looking forward to what happens next. My name is Susan Rosano, and I'm a mosaic and mural artist. I've been a master teaching artist for about 20 years. <laughs> Um, before I moved to Vermont, I did most of my work in Connecticut. Um, and when I lived there, I was on a roster for the State of Connecticut Commission on the Arts. And I also was privileged to be on a roster of a group called Young Audiences of Connecticut. And now they're called Arts for Learning. And that group, Arts for Learning and Young Audiences, was um, an agency that booked artists into schools, museums, hospitals, libraries, 
uh, senior centers, after school programs, any place that wanted to have some sort of an art project going on, whether it was music, dance, uh, theater, visual arts, they were able to call that agency and get funding from the state of Connecticut and other types of grants and also have the artists uh, come into their facility and do something fun with their community. Um, fun and meaningful, really. And so once I got myself established on that roster, I did have some fun ideas and you know would always launch a different and new idea over to the group and see if they wanted me to start that project. So my first project of really doing murals was an environmental art project, which um, I did, the project was mostly done on 55 gallon oil drums. And so I called it oil drum art. And um, I would go into like a library and the people in the library, whether it was um, teenagers or adults who wanted to participate in this project all came in and already knowing that they needed to create some sort of an environmental painting that they wanted to put onto a barrel. And all the barrels had themes, and it was worked out quite well. Um, so barrels were painted, and they were recycled barrels that were used as a statement for an artist to make about the environment and about how we would like the environment to be beautiful and back to natural and normal and peaceful and quiet and everything else. And so that project went along for quite a while in Connecticut, and I was privileged to do that project in many, many towns um, all over the state. And as I progressed through, I started doing mural work as well in different schools, and I could see the real value of all of these <coughs> kinds of projects where, you know, myself as the lead artist was sort of planning um, the design and composition of these things, and then the community at large could come and participate in it because I already had drawings done on things in pencil and they could paint something however they wanted to do. And, and usually these designs came out beautifully and everybody was really happy and excited about it. Um, so a couple of examples that I would like to use tonight were things that I felt really great about doing and um, really the the best one, and this has actually been my last project that I've done in Connecticut, was down in Newtown, Connecticut. Um, I was contracted by a school down there called the Middlegate School, and they had a after-school arts program for families who were uh, touched by the children who were killed in the Sandy Hook School. And um, this school, Middlegate, took students in from this the Sandy Hook School after they shut, because they shut the school down after that happened. So they divvied up the kids and they all went to different spaces. So now it's two years later and the school community wanted to make these murals to just sort of show the town and the public that the community was now kind of moving on from their grief. So they gave me themes which were really kind of hard themes to create images for. But the community did that quite well, um, using the words love and caring and kindness and, um, and perseverance and, um, just I can't think of them all, but peace was another one. And so the, the community who, were, who was coming to this program created designs, drawings, they all gave them to me, and I turned the murals, so we did nine murals together, and I turned them all um, into really nice compositions, which I drew, and then everyone would come and paint on the mural at night. So over 200 people from the community participated in painting these murals, and they had a huge opening, and the state senators were there, the um, state representatives came. Um, it was a really great thing, and it was so great for the whole community to be able to come out and work on this and show how they were feeling now after the tragedy that came along in their lives. Um, so I use that as an example of, um, it's kind of a bigger thing and communities usually don't have that kind of tragedy happen, but um, to be able to say how you're feeling through your artwork and then display it in the community is just an absolutely amazing thing. And I think that in this community, 
it can be done quite well um, to just just to say how we all feel about community around here as uh, Brattleboro is a big arts community with a big population of artists and um, I really hope that as time goes by murals and all sorts of projects can be made um, so that the community can work on them together as a community as a group of artists and so I didn't get to my second project but sorry about that <laughs> My name's Bob Stevens, and um, I, I'm uh, the owner of Stevens & Associates. We're a design firm. Um, I've been working in this town for, another, I think another year will be 30 years working in this town on various projects. And I mostly wanted to come tonight because I was looking to learn. So how do we incorporate art into our public spaces as a, as a student and somebody who has run down that course many different times? Not to say, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize you know, we uh, travel the country, talk about placemaking and urban places, and Brattleboro has a great asset. We are known around this country as a great downtown. And, and a part of that, I'll use that term placemaking again, you know, art is an integral component to people relating to the space that's around them, feeling comfortable in that, feeling safe, feeling like it's an exciting and an interesting place. Where, where I'm looking, for knowledge is to figure out how to pay for it, to be honest with you. I mean, we have many, many cases where we have um, created space for that. Um, you know, the building across the street is a great example, the Brooks House. We created this great atrium campus for art, and working with Giddings Mitchell, we do have a gal some gallery space in there, but it's a struggle to sort of say, how do, we, how, do we, how do we take that element, because everything else is so hard to finance. Um, and I can I could tell you you know 20 years ago where we were designing space for the waterfront and had enhancement grants that we uh, put together for the town that actually got funded, but the state it was a transportation enhancement grant we had a, an allowance of thirty thousand dollars to the public art in that, and that's the one piece that they pulled out of the funding. Everything else got funded, um, you know the sidewalks got funded, the components, the physical pieces, but that public art piece did not. Um, so. You know, it's happening, there's momentum growing. We have the brand, people know that that's what we are, but you don't see it when you get out here. And there's so many opportunities. You know, this space um, was created uh, by a community group, the space that we're in tonight, um, and is a great sort of canvas for great, and you're seeing great things happening with this. It took a long time to sort out how that gets managed, how that gets done. Um, Plenty Park is another great example that for those that have been around long enough, that was the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. It was once called Donut Park, <coughs> by the way, that was the name. Um, you can't get, it took a long time to get the name Plenty Park, and I finally gave up. I was like, let some other group decide that. But it's a great space. It has a mural on the wall, and, and murals in a lot of cases are used in, in urban fabric where we have a problem. You know, we don't have a good street edge. There's no windows in that wall because they're meant to be another building. So you can use it to mitigate, but it creates, it has the element of creating interest and permeability and comfort for people to, to sit in that. I just, I want to go back to the economics. Um, so as in, in the course of our career, um, you know, we now sort of help try to build urban places, downtowns across uh, this area. And mostly it's about trying to make the economics work. And, I'll relate to you a story that I heard from uh, a couple of years ago at a conference from the leader of American real estate, and the largest real estate owner in the country, actually. And he was talking about the growth of walkable urban places and downtowns and mixed use, how hard mixed use was. So here's what he said, and, and, I, and I remember this because it's something that we've known and tried to learn how to do inherently. He said, you know, I can rent upstairs, people want to live downtown now, I can rent upstairs all day long, but I can't rent anything upstairs if my ground floor isn't activated and isn't exciting. Now, if you don't have a first floor placemaking place, you know, retail that's active, energy, excitement on the street, um, you know, art, a, a physical place that people want to hang out where you feel safe and comfortable, people don't want to be in that space. So. It's not just a aesthetic, gee, we'd like to do this. It's a necessity to have a successful place. It's a, it's a necessity to have a successful downtown. I think it's great that people are coming together, because I'd love to hear more about how to make 
that happen, how to add on, build on the momentum that's here, and, um, and, and see if we can kind of reinforce and sort of build that going forward. So, you know, thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Broski. Uh, I grew up in Brattleboro. When I was a boy, my uh, uncle worked at the Holstein Frisian, and they used to give him a card with an outline of a calf. He'd go out to the farms and paint in the spots so they'd keep it in their files, and they'd have a record of all the calves born in Vermont. He was a landscape painter, and uh, that's all I ever wanted to do was walk these mountains and uh, paint landscapes. But things happened, and I got a free studio in New York, and I ended up being uh, one of the first artists to work on the street in the uh, street art movement of the early 80s in Manhattan. Um, I curated a few shows down there of those artists. I think what's special about Brattleboro is uh, the fact that we have so many volunteers. You know, back when the uh, highway was completed here around 1960, a lot of enlightened and creative minds started to come to Brattleboro in the arts, in politics, in the colleges, Marlboro College, Wyndham College, uh, the Liberty Union Party, the beginning of the socialist uh, movement here in Vermont. I think all that you know, comes together to make a great atmosphere for public art, which everyone can share. Um, and as far as money is concerned, attached to it, I don't make that uh, you know, the focus. I think if you're an artist, you know, your public work is your public work. You make your work from your, make your money from your studio. We have uh, volunteers here, including artists, performers, landscapers, uh, even masonry and carpentry people, uh, documentation people who would all, you know, love to do stuff here. And, uh, you know, what we need is organization. We have the Wyndham Arts Council, who uh, <coughs> started the uh, cooperative gallery some years ago when, when artists didn't have a gallery to show in in Brattleboro and uh, nowadays galleries make 60 percent of their money at the art fairs so it seems logical that the Wyndham Arts Council should help the Brattleboro galleries get to the art fairs. Um, that would be a, an update on that uh, kind of uh, involvement. The Brattleboro Arts Committee should not be a conceptualizing entity, it should be a facilitating entity and uh, that uh, committee needs to be a go-between for boys who want, people who want to do things and groups that want to uh, involve uh, their projects with the town have to go through the select board. The Arts Committee is a, a go-between for arts projects, organizer for performances, a go-between for gardeners, landscapers, assistance uh, for the gallery uh, galleries who should form a group like they used to have and have a club that meets once a month so that they can get organized and make this gallery walk about art again instead of about cookies. Um, we used to have that and that group could report to the art committee to uh, have things enacted that it wants to do through the select board. Uh, what the art committee really needs also is to have great paperwork uh, to make it easy for anyone that wants to do anything in terms of all these things I mentioned public art performance, public landscaping, uh, documentation, that'd be film, and uh, other things. Um, they should have great paperwork, the art committee, this is their responsibility. So the people that want to come in can get that paperwork, have everything explained to them, don't have to waste the art committee's uh, time trying to learn about what are we doing, how do you do it, all in the paperwork, take it home, who to call, how to arrange it, types of funding, and uh, and we could get a lot more done that way because the art committee has changed people many, many times over and not much gets done to the committee. Right now we're finishing up the, uh, uh, my uh, partner worker, uh, Joe Barrows, who's done a lot of work downtown for everybody here uh, in the public art stuff that we've been working on over the years. We're finishing up the refurbishing of the walls at the back of the Harmony parking lot and uh, that is going to be a book mural again which I'm going to draw out in the next few days. Um, but this time it's going to be books for all different artists. And uh, you have to have a website. It's easy to get a website. You can get on a group website if you're, if you're not on one. Uh, real simple, probably for free on the internet. Uh, then you, uh, you're going to contact us. You're going to have to ask me how because i got one minute left. But 
you contact us to find out how to get a book there, which we want to have done during the October gallery walk and the two days after uh, out there in the, in the uh, parking lot. You can do three quarters of the book in the style of your art and you can then put your website on the book so that tourists who come here can look at your work and see more of it on the web. Uh, this thing here, we have to thank uh, Bill Fleming for this fantastic yeah, When Jill and I volunteered to refurbish this mural, we had no idea what it was. Oh, it was so special. But once the thing was finished, all of a sudden they started lining up every 20 minutes. You have tourists out there taking each other's photograph. Uh, it's a homemade postcard. I was in Brattleboro. Here I am. We didn't even know what it was. But, uh, you know, it's a fantastic thing. And we've got to get another parking space uh, you know, on the front of it. Donations too, right? But uh, it, it was it was done with uh, it was done with small time donations. I got a whole list of people to thank here. Um, but right now, I want to direct your attention to this uh, piece of paper, which you can get at the table as you leave. And this is the website which we have on the internet, which goes with all the patterns that I've painted downtown. I think there's a total of fifty-eight or fifty-seven. There are maps, and each one has a picture of the painting that was done downtown and a picture of the original inspiration for it, which may have been a Chinese bronze urn or a pre-Columbian weaving or an African uh, piece of beadwork. They're all on there and, uh, you know, we made this so it could be educational. This is, this is the potential that we have, you know. Public art can be involved with creating public spaces uh, that enhance the downtown. It can all work together with the gardeners. What we need is organization. Uh, we need these groups to be crystallized and to be able to work with the art committee and work with each other. And, uh, you know, that takes a lot of people's uh, interest. In the meantime, we are looking for people to uh, help us to promote the book mural between now and the, uh, and the gallery walk. this, and I actually do have a question, that something that weighs on me, um, but before we get to that, I, I think this was a great opportunity to hear about all the different ways um, through the use of bodies, I don't know if that's on PC to say, but the use of bodies, the use of space, um, and thinking about public art as both permanent and as the temporary, so whether you are someone who plays music or you know you do um, circus arts or what, uh, whatever other chalk art even um, I met a chalk artist who's here today um, so there are all sorts of ways that we can think out of the box that doesn't necessarily involve needing to get permits and sorry I said that out loud um, but so one of my questions though that I would like to either pose to panelists or maybe hear from others about um, is the dissemination of information because one of the downsides of some of the great things that are happening like the mural in Harmony Lot, not everybody is privy to that information and I do find in some of the discussions I've had with many that information is just not getting out like how do we even get to the basics of sharing information of getting inclusivity um, so open that up and then what we'd like to do is invite others to ask their questions or make commentary. I know that uh, Jake Roberts was trying to create a central website which had everything, performance, uh, uh, options, you know, possibilities, walls that would be available for artists. And this is a central website, you know, so the, the concept is that everyone, all performers, you know, all artists, uh, get this as an email and uh, that there would be one central place for performers which would have all of the different performance spaces in Brattleboro and that they would be scheduled through that calendar. So if it was going out to everyone then they'd be able to see what was happening, where there were spaces open and then they could contact whoever 
to uh, get on that calendar. The, uh, the, the other stuff, the, um, you know, other things would be events, you know, uh, that had to do with uh, public art and stuff, and that would also be on there. But the, the whole thing, the big problem is creating that email list, getting everybody to get the email, and then who's, <laughs> Byron Greyrex tried to start uh, that website. Um, but he got frustrated with uh, something having to do with, I don't want to say the town or anything, because just somebody, I'm not sure. Thank you. I, I was just going to say, I, I think you want to, if it's dissemination, the thing that, that connects to me, because you know, there's just so much information out there is storytelling. You know, if that story about the book mural was something that ran in the paper, Facebook, other things, that that's kind of how I think you can reach the most people is, is, is to tell those stories and figure out the forums, the different forums and ways that you can get that out there. And, and then in terms of, you know, public input, it probably depends on the scale of the, of the art. If it's temporary, if it's something, you know, we've done a lot of public engagement processes for things that are temporary and are going to be here for generations. And that's, that's warranted for that kind of input and, and energy and effort. Um, but if it's uh, not that permanent, then I think it's you know three people who are really dedicated and want to do something and get something done, and not have to burden it with so much public input, and and, uh, and sometimes just getting something done is worth a lot. So that's really my yeah. This is why you know I've always been saying at the art committee meetings. I really think that you have to have you know uh, a separate thing for performance and a separate thing for public art. Because performance has a certain set of needs. They need, uh, you know, to be promoted. They need to be scheduled. They need to uh, maybe have their work reviewed by somebody that would know if it's the right thing. And then public art needs a different set of things. It needs funding. It needs a lot of times, you know, most of the stuff that we've done has been done through donations. All of the, uh, this is important for anybody that wants to do anything here in Brattleboro. All of the hardware stores and paint stores have a uh, donation budget, yearly donation budget. And the closer to January you are uh, getting in, and, you know, the better chance. And you know what they want? They want a photograph of what you did for their office and a mention if you have some stuff in the newspaper. But um, I just think that, you know, the gardening people, the performance people, the public art people all have different needs but all need to work together and you know that's we have the art committee but I mean you know we really need a structure yeah, so why don't we open it up because I, I definitely want to have an opportunity for whether there are comments or whether there are questions to see what questions may come forward Del did you have a question no I have one from uh, Mr. Stevens it's more like uh, an answer you're looking for and that is when I used to write grants, mostly for myself and my friends when I was in college. And what happens if you want this public money and you want it from philanthropists and you want it from the National Endowment, you may write a three-page proposal, but it's you people that actually make it happen. Because when you write, you may have three pages for your proposal. And the rest are references, supporting <clears throat> references from your towns, your businesses, your community members. And that's usually what the foundation who you're going to for this money gives you on. It, it really does matter that you send in all that information with you. And you right here have started the ball rolling. So if we use you and we say, Marcia, can you write me a reference? I'm writing a public arts grant. And can you write me a reference and tell me why our town needs it? Mr. Stevens, can you write me as a business a reference for public art? And then you start working on your artists and everybody to write. That's where you get your money from, is that support. 
plus your idea, but mostly they look at you and say, okay, this person's done their homework. They have a great support team. We're going to help them. Okay? That's a little bit of an answer for you. Okay? The other is, you and I got to talk. <laughs> There are, okay, I'm the chair of the Town Arts Committee. There are some things we can do legally here in this town and other things we cannot when it comes to public art. One is you cannot advertise your business on the, any public wall. And what you were explaining about putting on the books, we got to talk. That's so that people can see more of the work. No, you can't do it. That's advertising. Wait, you so, mean an artist cannot put, a, I mean, it's the same as putting up a flyer. You mean to tell me that an artist can't put their website on? No, yeah, no. This, is, this is what... That's advertising. We consider it as a channel. Yeah, no, it's not we advertising. We consider it's, that advertising. You're going to have to talk... Yeah, we'll to have to explain the, why it's not advertising. It's, it's, it's advertising. Yeah. 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 continue this. Yeah. Um, so we got to talk later. Yeah. Shooting yeah, yourself we'll, in the yeah. foot deal. No, we're going to talk. We'll, well, but talk. I think we should definitely keep this moving along. Yeah. And, but um, anyways, yeah. when you're working with public art, you have to abide still by law, <coughs> whether you put it near a road or whatever. And that's what the Town Arts Committee is about, is to keep everybody focused on what they uh, can do, possibilities, and help them to meet their goals. Yeah, we're planning yes. on reviewing the websites, like my website, no prices, no way to buy anything. We'll See? Talk well, later. Yeah, let's let's. I'm sure what we what will happen from this meeting is there will probably be a lot of loose ends and a lot of questions. Um, we definitely probably should shift it. Does anyone else have a comment or a question that they wish to? Wow. All right, so I'm going to do it this way. You, you, and then you. So you go. And then stand if you wish. I'm John Loomerding. Um, being, I'm a former director of the uh, Battleborn Music Center and worked with the Arts Council and the Arts Committee for years. Um, starting a new festival called Fantastic Wantasticit. And the, the idea of Fantastic Wantasticit is relating people to our environment, especially nature, <coughs> nature around us. Um, and uh, that the installation artist that uh, Shanta mentioned is here. This is Tree McFarland, creator of the vines, which many of you may have seen overlooking Whetstone Brook, in addition to the chalk art that she's well known for. Uh, and um, I'm happy to introduce her. She was one of the first presenters in our kickoff for Fantastic Fantastic on the 16th. And there'll be further events in that this month. John, do you have a question for the panel or something yes. you want to raise? I, I wanted to raise. Uh, a priority of relating art to the beauty of the natural environment around us. I think to me, I think I think that's a, that should be a priority. And I also wanted to make a point in response to what some of the panelists had said. I, I believe that um, uh, in all nonprofit endeavor, the funding follows the work, and in, in particular with the arts, the funding follows beauty. When you create things that are beautiful, and all of you up here have been involved doing that. You've been able to, uh, and most of you probably, have secured funding for the things that you've created. I mean, I know the work that, that you've all done, and it's very, very important. It, it's, it's a cardinal rule that the funding and the support will follow the beauty that you create. Did anybody want to comment on that, or should I go to the next? Well, I just think that, you know, John, it's great that he wants it to be about beauty, but anyone can have an equal opinion. It could be about anything anyone wants. Just as important what someone else wants as what John wants. Okay. Uh, Arlene. <clears throat> so, uh, following up on what Dale said, I think it is important for us all to be able to communicate with each other. So I didn't see a sign-up sheet, but there should be. Oh, there is a sign-up sheet. I'm sorry. There I, is. Let me, okay. let me apologize for that right now. Um, towards the back, 
uh, there, there are sign-up sheets off to one side, and one of them is labeled for post-potluck follow-up. So we are collecting, and if you've been hearing from me numerous times, I already have your email address. <laughs> and I will make sure to pass it along. So no, that's a definitely a good point. Uh, and there's information in the back. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Yeah. So um, about funding, there's a group of us that have tried for years to do a 1% for art. So at the last town meeting, I'm a town rep, at the last town meeting, somebody stood up and said, you know, we're talking about money and funding for this and that. We call ourselves an arts town, and there's no money <coughs> for art. And he was, after the meeting was over, he was like rushed <laughs> by a bunch of us. Um, who are determined to bring it up at the next town meeting, that there be in the budget a 1% for art. Yes. So I'm going to come right back to you, I promise. I see three hands going this way, but then you in the black shirt, I'm so sorry, I don't know your name. I want to make sure I give you one second. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, so it's actually a little bit more of a comment and an answer, which um, Dale, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name in the purple shirt, and I think um, we kind of segued for this beautifully. We've talked about where the money comes from. Um, I'm an engineer, um, and of what I work with is stress. Um, I work to design the stress out of systems. So we've actually worked on a project before. I was the one who brought the uh, timber framers to Pilney Park. You might not remember that. Yeah. So anyway, um, the thing about design and how this relates to bringing the money and how we get um, involvement in art and seeing the art in this community for me, it's an engineering problem. Um, if we talk about separating the people from the art, there's a problem. Everything automatically, the funding fails. Because when we design a, a place, we're, we're talking about lighting, we're talking about obstacles like walls and windows and variation in steps. We're talking about how the natural light enters the place. But when we talk about where the funding comes from, we're talking about how the human element is willing to apply their time, energy, and resources. Resources being money is one of those resources. But Brad of Laurel, like everybody's been saying here, is absolutely amazing at bringing all those other resources, the energy and the time, and hey, yeah, I'll try it. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that this whole group needs to think about is one, what is the normal path people are taking and why is it art in that place? And two, why are we creating a place for art if nobody's already going in that place? Because that's how you end up with places that are completely empty all the time and there's nobody seeing the art that's in there. Can I so, comment on that? Sure. I totally disagree with that. Um, what I've found, you know, since I began making street art in the early 80s, is that you have these areas, these places that no one's noticing. They become waste places. Around people, around here, people drop their furniture there, their trash, people sleep there, there's needles on the ground, whatever. By putting public art there, you change the energy. Yep. And, and, uh, and if I may, you're leading into my next comment. Well, uh, you know, this is what what takes those places and makes them, you know, not invisible and includes them into the right. downtown Can environment. Can you give that a one word name? Can I give it a one word name? Yeah. Yes. That's not art. Parangaricutini <laughs> miquaro. <laughs> and that means, could you help the unknown out? <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to help me out with that. So I'm <laughs> out <a> translator. <laughs> no, I don't think yeah. that you can give it a one word name. I can. What would you give it? What's Love. Mm. Because everything we are expressing with our art 
and standing here in this community and rushing up saying, no, we will bring you the money. That's love. That's the energy. That's the time. That's the resources. That's not money that when you are on the path and you suddenly make that shift by saying, uh, I want to do some art here. Anybody want to show up? Oh, never mind. I'll just start doing it myself. Oh, you want to help? Yeah, here, go over there. That's love. Right there. That's and not exactly the way it works. Well, I you work with humans. You have, like, for instance, this mural that we just prepared the wall for. Mm -hmm. I went to the Brattleboro Art Committee you know, 10 years ago when they first began and said, are you guys going to clean up the murals that are messed up in town? And they never did anything about it. Right. And finally, years later, you know, we got the Art Committee to basically look the other way while we fixed up this mural and the stuff that we did next to it. Um, the, uh, the book mural, that's been a project that's been going on, like I said, since I tried to get them to focus on it when they first began, it was like 10 years ago, or eight years ago, I'm not sure. And then, you know, we put in months of hard work, patching the cement, you know, just You're reworking the point, whole actually. wall. And now you have the current head of the arts committee coming in here and saying, you can't put your websites on because it's advertising. Well, hold, hold when on. this was approved years, no, you know, you years ago, website, you know, so years there, ago. Well, there's then there's there's the component. <clears throat> so you see, you it's not that easy. It's like you have all these things from the town trying to, you know, artists who live here in Brattleboro are asked all the time for donations. But we don't have a, a collector base here. No, it's activated. No, no, no. Stop you know, for so a there's really well, hold no. Hold on. Let's, let's actually second. keep this as a dialogue. So <laughs> when you did what you did and said, forget it. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna do it while they're not looking. You brought the love, and then everybody started showing up. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Right. That can be planned. But it can't be completely planned. <laughs> well, that's just it. That's the beauty of it. You can plan it to go. You don't know how it's going to go, but you can plan the start point. And that is what I kind of want to bring here and kind of say, this is not um, the money's out there. The connection is through love. And we need to talk about, one, where are people already being? And two, there's, I don't want to give you a dissertation on it, but there's more to it. And it's talk about the love and where people are already walking the path. Thank you very much. Before I move to the other hands, because I know there's Marsha, there's Esther, then there's this gentleman over here. Did anybody else on this panel want to speak to that point or comment or piggyback? Before um, I'd like to actually uh, add something to uh, the question that came before, just a comment about the 1%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I want to make a statement that I don't want anyone to think that I believe, but I just want to sort of uh, show the flip side of things. Um, I thoroughly believe that artists should be paid for the work that they do. Um, and I think it would be amazing if the town and the community and the government or whatever that is could uh, support them. However, I work with a lot of young people who are struggling to pay their bills in this expensive town. And I think we have to be very careful to weigh the balance of um, adding an additional tax or an additional cost to live in this town that will um, be a, potentially be a detriment to the people that we're actually trying to serve. Um, I just think that's a bigger conversation. Thank you. So I'm going to, I'm going to, did you want to respond to what? Yeah. Um, which is? Which way am I? I'm Elsie. <laughs> <laughs> Elsie. So the 1% that we're talking about is like 1% of the 1% that Rooms and Meals gets for Brattleboro. There's, I, th I think it's just 1% of Rooms and Meals. We're allowed to keep it. Th this is why people come to Brattleboro, right? For the arts, for rooms, for, you know, that's why they stay here and eat here. So it makes sense that the art should be a, bene a beneficiary. <coughs> That's 
Well, so I'm going to go to, I know Marsha had her hand up, then Esther, then this gentleman over here, if that's okay with you, John. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Marsha. I've only been here for two years. I was in Florida in 2015. I was in the St. Petersburg area, and for the two-year period prior to that, there was a resurgence in St. Petersburg. It was art that reestablished that town as a major tourist attraction. So I was very much a part of that whole scene at the time. Now the odd thing was that, I don't even know how many people are aware of this, there was a national contest about the most artistic town in the United States. The two people, the two towns that were in the running was St. Petersburg and Brattleboro. <laughs> and the thing was, St. Petersburg kept jumping ahead, jumping ahead, Everybody in St. Petersburg said, don't think he's going to win, because when the Unitarian Church in Brattleboro finds out about this, everyone's going to vote for <laughs> And it was a real funny thing. So now here I am in Florida with the intention of moving to Brattleboro. I couldn't wait to get here. I saw what they were doing in St. Petersburg. And if Brattleboro were the same, it was so exciting. And I got here, and it wasn't anything. And I think... To me, once you live here, you realize the depth and the richness of the arts and the culture. It's wonderful. It should be visible. It should be right out there for people to see. Well, this is what we're trying to do. And that's why I'm part of this. Connecting people with the artists and their work. Yes. That's great. Um, yeah, I just want to make a comment. I totally agree with Marsha that you know, I've been living here for almost four years now. and coming from Connecticut, which is really not known as a, an art place, um, <clears throat> but it seems like a lot of the cities and towns, whether they're part of the areas that have a lot of money or part of the areas that don't, still really worked a lot with artists to do a lot of different things, murals and concerts, and you know, it just seemed like the arts was, was so much more um, supported by the population and that everyone sort of knew that the arts brings in people from other places and tourists come to see it or, you know, um, people want to buy some of the art that they see. And so I, I too, you know, read that Brattleboro was this great arts community, which it really is. And there's so many people around here that are incredible. Artists, poets, musicians, you know, theater people. But yeah, it needs to be more seen out on the street when someone comes here as a tourist and they walk around and like Scott said, you know, you come to gallery walk and there's people on the street with cookies and then you're like, where else do we go besides, you know, seeing that you can tour the galleries, but on the street there should be more art on the street. Something that's just about the art. Yeah. That's what it was originally. But I'm talking about visual art here, guys. I'm not talking about performance. Gallery Walk is always about uh, visual art. Performance in Brattleboro is very successful, in my opinion. Um, the local people here are willing to support almost anything you do. You know, down the latches, you have you know tons of things that go on there. Everybody turns out. You know, uh, we have fantastic audiences because people here in this economy can afford to buy a ticket for five or ten or fifteen or twenty or twenty-five dollars. But they can't afford to invest in art at the level that uh, professional artists have to charge in order to survive. And that is why I would never, ever recommend this town to an artist who wants to try and have a career or make any money or in any way be successful. You know, I think we have to remember here, don't forget that we are one of the most uptight parts of this country. We're the most liberal politically, but the most conservative socially. And every time somebody wants to do something in this town, the free people jump up and say, you can't do it for this reason, you know? And this is, this is it, you know? The town, the people, they gotta loosen up. They found out that Vermont, there was an article on the radio, uh, NPR, you know, that Vermont has the second highest number of artists per capita in the United States. Now, I don't know where Brattleboro figures in in that number, but we've got to have one of the highest numbers per capita in the country. And this town has got to let us do what we want. We should have artists on the select board, you know? 
Um, these people, they don't understand what we're trying to do. They don't know where we're coming from. They've got all these rules, you know, you've got to go fit, you know, into the square hole and all this stuff. You know, this is not the way it's going to happen, you know. We need an artist, you know, where's Bill Hayes? Where is he? You know, we need an artist on the select board because they don't get it. It's not happening. Uh, it's... It needs to so, come to wait, light. hold on one second. I see a bunch of hands. So, there's... <laughs> let me see if I can keep track here. There's Esler. There's that gentleman over there. And then there is a popcorn of hands here and a hand in the back. So, why don't we start with you, Esler? Cool. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. My name is Esler. I am a filmmaker, activist, part of the Art Council. And I wrote some things before I forgot, because I sometimes forget. So, I'm going <laughs> to... So, the first thing I want to say is, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but last year, uh, Brad, uh, Wyndham County, specifically Wyndham County, won a bunch of awards. Uh, I think we won most of the awards at the, uh, is it the Governor's Awards Governor's or something like that? Yeah. <coughs> so, we are doing good stuff. So, I think you all deserve a round of applause for doing good stuff. So, we're doing the work. So, we, we are doing it. And I think that's the exciting part of it, that we are doing it, and we're getting recognized. And sometimes when there's all this like momentum, we get, ah, it's like, it's, it's like a stream, right? There's all this water and there's all this movement and all this, you know, muddy water. So that's where we are right now, right? So what do we do from then, right? Are, are we, what are, what are we gonna do from there? And I like what you, what is your name? Kathy. Kathy. I love that you brought love into it because that is super important. We have, uh, People struggling, living, the young people, you were saying that there's young people struggling day to day, there is. There's people that are uh, addicted to uh, 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 various things, but we have an opium epidemic right here in town, right? So we are facing all these issues. And I believe that the, one of the best, best weapons that we can use is love and art. It takes all of us. It takes all of us. And I see a few young people, but we have to start thinking, what are we going to give to the young people that are coming right behind us? What is, it, what is that we're paving, paving them, right? What is the road that we're paving to them? Just last year, though, I mean, last week, I don't know if you heard of the Brad Rock um, Festival that happened. Oh, my God, that is beautiful, right? That was so many young people playing music for each other, creating beautiful music. Collaborating, that is what we need. We need more of that. Coming together. All these things of divisive, like of, of you do this, like it's, it's, we need to come together, right? We need to come together and start creating these things. The last thing I want to say is resources. Yes, we need resources. And I think we have the best time in history right now. We have the best tools. I have this thing right here. With this thing, if there's an art project that I want to be part of, I can put my five bucks. That is not that much money, but it is something. And we can all provide that, right? We can all do that. We can create a fund, a, a, a community fund that is just for the arts here. That we can, I can give my two, five bucks, ten bucks. I know some of you can do that too. And if we all come out and say, well, those are the projects, that are, we can fund those things. It is possible because we have this kind of tools. So I think this is really exciting times. And I think it's important that we have these meetings and I'm so happy that you're all here and that we're gonna continue this talk because we have the tools, we have the people, we have the young people and we have some problems that we need to deal with. So it, this is a great start. So let's, let's continue this and don't forget that it all has to be surrounded by love, right? Like that's the most important thing, it has to be surrounded by love. So I just wanna thank all of you for, for being here. <laughs> I just wanted to comment and, and let you know that, uh, you know, the stuff, the patterns that were done in the Harmony parking lot, uh, the money that was raised for it uh, was done on the uh, sidewalk out here during a rainy gallery walk. Five and ten dollar, two dollar, one dollar donations uh, made that possible. I think I made two hundred dollars in three hours on a rainy night. And that's how badly people want to give, how much people like to give, what they can afford to give. And that's why, you know, to this whole thing, when I've gone to the art committee meetings, I've always stressed the idea of low-level funding. I personally love the idea of public art being produced by the public. 
because not only then when, when you see it do you like it, but you can also say, hey, I got $5 in that uh, paint up there. I didn't mean to be negative when I was saying, you know, they don't get us so much, but uh, there is a lot of bureaucracy that you have to go through to try to do something uh, on a public wall in Brattleboro. If you pick a private wall, it's going to happen in like one-tenth the time because most of the people around here will want to work with artists. But uh, we, we do need, we need so badly for the art committee to really create a, uh, an easy way for people to be in one of the groups that I was mentioning and to use the art committee to organize things with the select board. Thank you, Scott. No. <clears throat> I think the gallery walk itself of Brattleboro has failed the artists of Brattleboro. The gallery walk should spend more time creating within. They should try to have more workshops. People want to do watercolor, people want to do oil, people want to do woodworking. Instead of just having shows, they should try to set up a program where one month we're going to call it watercolor month and get these watercolor people. It's not a matter of making money, it's a matter of getting these people exposed to what they do. There are a lot of artists out there that have a few great paintings, but they never get to show them, they never get to see them because they can't afford to go to a gallery. But if this gallery walk wants to continue to help Frater Row, it should do something for the artist. It should create workshops a Saturday morning where nine photographers can go shoot a building or a bunch of watercolor people like when they had it down on the river in the canoes. That was a great experience for a lot of watercolor people. You got your little canoe and they went out and they paddled and they shot the island. But you can do that with other things. There are people that do steel work, woodwork. I do needlepoint. There's people like that are artists. But they need they need time and they need to be shown. They need help. The gallery walk does not help artists. It just shows only those exposed. We just need more exposure to the artists of Brattleboro. That's why I want everyone here, it's an artist, to sign up for one of these books. Get your exposure. John, I think you had a pop corner cans in this section. Yeah, so. Um, so I have a few things to say. I grew up in Brattleboro, and I used to hang out on the street, be sketchy. Um, and I'm not anymore. My life is very rich and healthy and safe. And I think that what I see as a potential goal of a public art initiative is to inspire those who are struggling that there's more to life than what they're faced with. And I also think that, you know, when you're talking about, okay, we have cell phones, uh, you need a website, like, not everybody has access to those resources. Yes. It's easy. We, yeah. No, <laughs> stop. Yeah, a cell <laughs> phone, but a website. I'm just saying, not everybody has access to those resources. To, to set those kinds of rules, to expect people to be able to make a website, is very challenging for a lot of people, so you're immediately excluding people. That's not so, said the whole town. I'm just. It's only for that one mirror. I understand. I understand. I'm just. I'm, I'm not saying that like what you're doing is wrong. I'm just saying in the grand scheme of planning public art as a community, those things should be taken into consideration. And you know when you are talking about trying to um, give people access to have a voice in this process, that needs to be t in, taken into consideration as well. Not everybody has an email address. Not everybody can check their email every day. Um, some people probably don't ever at all. So anyways, it's just bearing all that in mind. Um, when we're making community art and public art to inspire, we should think about how to inspire and also to enliven and enrichen our community and benefit our community. We should think about the whole grand scheme and how every step of it step of it can benefit the community. So if the artists are being paid for their art, 
that are benefiting the economy of our community because those artists are part of the community. They, you know, not everybody has the luxury to volunteer. A lot of people don't. Um, I don't. <laughs> you know, I've tried. It never works out. Um, so I would just say, like, if you look at the entire project or group of projects in that light, you can look at how, okay, how can this problem be solved to benefit the whole? Like, it's not, do, do you kind of get what I'm saying? Like, I, the part of what inspired me to come here was an, an initiative that happened in Lynn, Massachusetts, where, you know, they had gotten funding from the city? I don't, I don't know where they got that funding from, but the funding went to paying the artists giving money to the artists to go into the town and buy the resources that they needed so the small businesses didn't have to donate, they got the money. You know, like everybody benefited from the project on a whole and that was, I think, very inspiring for the community on a whole because they all felt like they were a part of it, they all felt like they were benefiting from it and, and all of the resources just went back into the community and now you know, they have tours and like, it's, it's awesome. There's like, it's, they do tours, they like go to all the coffee shops. The entire town is benefited from the project. So that kind of thinking, I think, could really help us. I have a question for you. I think. Um, yeah. So how do you reach those folks then, you know, if they don't have the means to have a computer or a cell phone or, you know, how, how can those um, sorts of people be reached so that they might know that they have an opportunity to come out and participate in something that, you know, would be beneficial to them? Well, I think both Scott and um, Ezra, I've seen you guys, do, you go and you talk to people, you know? No, I really don't have time for that. Well, it's, it's I, well you said, no, I'm, I'm saying, like, on, like, like you, you have reached the community. Like you said, you raise money on the street. Like that's that's what I mean. Like, Did that one gallery walk? Yeah. Yeah. Like you can um, invite people through a, a myriad of ways. I would say you know, we need flyers people to help with and, that and and outreach and that kind of thing. Like maybe make sure that anywhere where people need to go for resources because they're like below the poverty line, there could be some sort of something there allow like inviting them to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because that point is speaking to many episodes and incidences I gotten information to people and you know people have different ways and modes in which they want to receive information and we need to respect that especially if we're going to be inclusive the other thing I want to bring us back to is just recognizing to give each other time to speak and I certainly we we're not here to sing kumbaya we we're not going to agree with each other yeah. but I want to give everybody a chance to speak and so that's what I just wanted to remind everybody of that to be respectful and I know there are more hands in this clustered area Stefan I know you had a question tree I know you had a question and then there was a young lady over here so well, one thing that Maya said uh, mm -hmm. I think made reference to the idea of uh, site-specific work in other words the right kind of work in the right place like she was talking about some people have this, these facilities, or these, these, uh, uh, you know, machines or whatever. Other people don't. You know, there's different levels of professionalism in the arts, also. And uh, you know, someone may have one painting, and someone may have a whole body of work that people could look at. So that's what you know. In this particular painting, in this particular project, that's what we're addressing is those people that have a whole body of work and have a way for people to look at it. In other cases, there can be other uh, locations for people to do things that are different than that and they're more appropriate for that location. But uh, in terms of what you were saying about artists being able to survive, make money, um, you know, in, in an art scene, Everything helps everything else. 
The more there is, the better it is for everyone. So, you know, my opinion, if you have an idea, let's all get behind it. But, you know, someone else has an idea, let's get behind that, you know. And people that put a lot of work towards what they're trying to do, you know, let's jump in and help, you know. Who's next? I think it was Stefan, and then there is, there's Tree, and then there's a young lady over here, and then there's another hand. So, Stefan, did you have? Hey, um, I'm Stefan Brandstad. I've been here 30 years, more or less, mostly more than less, in Brattleboro. Um, used to own a record store down on Main Street. Um, gallery Walk started back in my day, and as I remember, it was sort of out of the motivation of uh, trying to bring more commerce to town and using art as a means of drawing people in. I could be all, a little wrong, wrong about that, but that's my recollection. <clears throat> um, to this day, I don't think it really does what it ever really intended to do, but I certainly don't think it harms the town. Um, so that said, um, when I came in earlier, there was about 70 people, some have gone, so I'm curious, who, from what's remaining here, is a visual artist? Because that's really what you all are talking about right now. You're talking about public art, but you really kind of seems that you're really, <coughs> excuse me, you've come to be centered down on visual art, uh, be it sculpture or hand painting and so on. Um, so I'm wondering who here is an artist in that particular day? Just curious. All right, so maybe 50% of who's here. My point is that why aren't the artists that you're all talking about? I'm a musician. I, you know, I, I think with it, I, I visualize with imagery, but I don't really paint. Um, so where are all the other artists that you're all trying to get organized? They're the ones who should be here. Again, my point is there seems to be an undercurrent of, we call it lethargy or disinterest, you know, on one hand they say, you know, yeah, we want to be a, we want to have an organization, we want to get organized, but then they don't turn out to participate. So, it's more of a statement or a comment than a question. Well, other than where are the artists? Well, I, I might just say that this is day one, step one. Um, I'm not sure what's going to come out of this. I hope we can um, begin to think in that way as this meeting continues. We have some other people to get to, but um, we clearly have some more people to bring in and reach and talk about. I certainly take a, a broader view of public art than um, just visual art, but, but some people don't. Yeah. Uh, because that's at least one way to start having money available for public art. Mm -hmm. uh, it also might be worth doing an auction to support that fund if it gets set up because, you know, every time there's some kind of an auction, I take a picture and I donate it to the okay. auction yeah, yeah. for the Humane Society, for this, for that, the other, and maybe if in fact artists gave works to create an endowment for public art, we would be able to donate it and also feel like it was contributing to art in the town. Uh, just real quick off of that, like I'm both a photographer and a Nonprofit gallery director here in town, and I, but people, you know, constantly. That's ninety-five percent of my job. How can we make more money? How can we make more money? How are we going to pay our rent this month? And members of VCP constantly remind me that yes, it's a difficult task at times to sell artwork, sell a print off the wall or an exhibit, but when we've got these stacks of prints in these boxes, you literally, it's like our savings account. I mean, art isn't always about money, but art can make money. And so when we're saying that, yes, we're artists, but we don't have a lot of money, but we have art that has value, and so how do you find people who are willing to make that investment? And, it, and that's also a marketing issue as far as like, you know, I don't know how much effort Gallery Walk as an organization entity does to bring people from outside of this community who, dare I say, might have more money than you do, <laughs> um, that might be coming in and injecting some 
funds into the community as far as like um, buying artwork. Um, I, I said it, buying artwork. <laughs> <laughs> this, this discussion is supposed to be about public like, art. We're talking about coming up with money, but like, and like finding money from other institutions. It is amazing that we live in a world where there is international network of the arts, the Mount Arts Council, the Mount Community Foundation, the Mount Humanities Council, etc. But we can also, without resorting to actual bake sale, um, we can make money <laughs> right here in this town, you know, by selling. I mean, the Insight Photography Project, which hosts their auction at BCP every fall, you know, raises like a third of their annual funds through a, a silent print auction for the month by having artists nationally, internationally, donating a print um, to their auction. They put up 300 prints and make like $30,000 or something weeks so um, I'm not saying it's easy and I know I'm spreading a pretty wide blanket statement here but like it just seems to me like we can really with enough organization and planning which is also a blanket statement um, the money's here this is why it's all it's all around here this it's is just why you galleries need to get together and have an organization of galleries like they did five, ten years ago, so you guys can discuss this. Because this discussion is about public art. It's not about bringing our money into the, the community. We need that very badly. But this, this discussion is about public art. But the galleries should have a gallery organization and meet so you guys can figure out how to make more money from the gallery walk for yourselves and for all the artists in town. But that's a different discussion I'm not than saying uh, this to make it a personal benefit thing for BCP. I'm just saying that you're talking about you guys should do this and you guys should do that. But this is a community you should, organization. You should, you should meet. You should, you should make gallery walk more vibrant. You should figure out how to do it. You're I'm saying a lot of views in that sentence. In the galleries. This very is not, this is not you, this is us. This is Brattleboro. We this are Brattleboro. This discussion is supposed to be about public art. This actually, you know? this discussion is about inviting everybody in and inviting everybody to the table to share their ideas. So I would have talked about figure, different things if I thought it was about bringing money into the art uh, It's scene. about a lot of different things. And public art can mean a lot of different things, especially when you talk about raising the vitality of a place. Yeah, and, so, and, and so there, there is an economic tie there and I, you know, I, there are lots of things I do want to echo, but I also want to be, I want to be conscious of people's time and I want to thank everybody who's still here. And I know, John, you wanted to look like you wanted to make a comment, so I don't want to. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can have a meeting too and maybe formulate something that um, makes some progress. Um, you know, in the midst of everything that was said, I think we identified a number of projects. I think a, a crowdfunded. Um, you know, on the phone funded um, mechanism for public art is a good idea that merits maybe a couple of people working on it. I think what Dr. Copan said about um, perhaps pooling um, some legal help and financial help and um, other people to create an endowed fund is a good idea. Gallery Walk doesn't know that we have all these plans for Gallery Walk and that we desire a lot of change for Gallery Walk. Some of the, uh, these ideas may have a lot of merit, but um, they don't know, and um, I think it would be a wonderful idea if um, some of us, um, you know, brought these ideas to them. Um, and uh, I think they are, um, they could use some more capacity and some more ideas. And um, so, you know, that's a project. That's a thing that we can take away, you know, and grow out, you know, do this. Um, it's been identified that, um, perhaps mechanisms for connecting, um, you know, willing private property owners and artists together um, is a, you know, it's a good idea and is a need that can be addressed, I think, in a fairly uh, efficient and smooth way. So um, that sounds like some people getting together and, and making that happen. So these are the things that, um, you know, we have names, we have addresses, um, and, um, 
you know, I, I don't think these are terribly big asks of people if they're, if they're together, but this is um, what I'm hoping might come out of this meeting is, um, or maybe we need another meeting and other people at the table, but, you know, we, amidst all the um, points of view, I think we've identified some projects that we can really do and we don't need uh, $50,000 to rain on us to get these projects going, although one of these projects is to get $50,000 to rain on us, um, that would be great. But, you know, I think this is what, you know, we've teased out uh, a number of things that are really on our minds, really either bothering us or uh, need to be said. But, um, you know, I think what those really are, are the genesis of some projects. Um, I'm not sure what the next step is, but, um, you know, we have people, we have names, addresses, we have passions, we have energies, we have areas of interest, and, um, you know, I think that might be a good basis for meeting number two. And, and yeah, and I, if I may piggyback, I actually would be doing a disservice if I did not say something about Gallery Walk, uh, <laughs> seeing as how the Arts Council, uh, it, you know, is one of the projects of the Arts Council. And I can tell you from personal experience as a newly former uh, Arts Council of Wyndham County president, in a volunteer role as president running Arts Council, that it's a capacity issue. And so there are so many things. And certainly it's helpful to have these ideas and suggestions, but also people have to come to the table too with follow-up. So I, I will say, not in defense of Gallery Walk, these, these ideas are very helpful, but without the people, you know, um, some of the things that we did start to do is we put dancers in some of the window storefronts and we put a DJ in one of the storefronts. It was really cool. But we needed more people to make that happen and there weren't that many people who, again, for whatever reason, people have got their own things. No blame. But I also want to say that that's why you, we cannot, you know, point fingers either. This, this, the purpose of this meeting and the piggyback what John was saying, it's not, it was to be in addition to the many conversations that have already been taking place and also possibly come out of here with other things that may take place afterwards and hopefully that happens. But the people have to come to the table because otherwise you have a few that get burned out or they can no longer keep the, be the engine. When you have a few that are the engine, the engine burns out. And so I just want us to be clear and conscious and also let's not make assumptions. Um, certainly there are people who could not be here tonight who just because they're not here doesn't mean that they may not become <coughs> the allies or some of the energy or resources and, and to listen to each other along the way, which is very important. Um, I, I want to be very conscious of the time. It's 844. And John, I want to ask you if you had any closing remarks or we definitely will be sharing the information out to if you left your name with us there's a sign up sheet in the back to allow us to be able to just at least send a thank you to everybody and also I know that Dell who is temporarily overseeing the town arts committee um, may have some plans of wanting to follow up and so we will be working with Dell on that ways for following up with people and making sure that um, tonight's meeting, which was taped, is accessible for everybody as well, including the people who could not be here. So um, again, thank you for your time. I also want to thank the panelists for your time. I know this is not an easy conversation to have. There are certainly lots of different dimensions of public art when we say public art and what that means. And so I, I appreciate all of you who volunteered your time and efforts to be thinking about this and all of you who joined us and who bravely spoke up and for some of you if you still have ideas burning that you have to um, let go of you can feel free to email myself or email John or email Dell or you know leave your ideas on the sheet but we again we're very grateful that you all took the time to come here tonight and John I don't know if you have more to add to that I think I said my piece okay perfect <laughs> thank you I have one last, one last thing. One last thing. Thank you, Sean. I, I, I'd just like to say that uh, I've listened to at least a hundred people talk about what should happen in this town. And there are five people 
who have done most of the artwork in downtown. And, you know, I'm asking you guys, what's wrong with this picture? So I want to, before we end on that note, the what's wrong with this picture, I actually want to give the rest of the panelists an opportunity. Are there any final thoughts you would like to leave with us? And you don't have to be compelled, but I want to give you that opportunity. Thanks for putting this together. It's yeah, great, great discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I know that the topic of the engine burning out, the volunteers that we have that do show up for Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, I hope thank this discussion you, can thank further you, go further. Well. Thank you, panel. Thank you. 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 Thank